So it's a pleasure to be here today and to uh, share with you some of our experiences in Lausanne. So what is the ERAS Essentials? You need a dedicated team. You need ERAS protocols. You need to be compliant to the protocol. And you need, of course, audit and research with the guidelines and the protocols of ERAS. And the three keys of the success is not to have only a dedicated team, but you have, you, you have to have uh, the management behind you, the direction of the, of the institutions, the head of your department. You, have also, you need also to have a support as a dedicated nurse, as Debbie in Magill, and we have also a dedicated nurse in Lausanne. So how do we do it? We made a very nice organigram of our institution with the head of the Department of Surgery and Anesthesiology and the administration. And we put three persons which, uh, who were referent for the nurses, for the anesthesiologist, and for the surgeon. And so we began to discuss. And I have to admit that someone, it was like very powerful persons having a very tough discussions. But at the end, uh, the ERAS team share a common objective and could uh, begin to work together. So what do we did? We made consensus on ERAS guidelines. We made protocol according to our institutions. We made care map for the patient's, care, uh, patient's uh, pathway and on 1st of May 2011, we began a new life. So we have our first patient in colorectal surgery. The, next, the, the, the year after that, in 2012, we did implementation course and we implement about 12 hospitals in Switzerland. In 2013, we included other surgery as pancreatic surgery, um, hepatectomy, urology, gynecology, and in a few months, we will include esophagectomy and gastrectomy also in the ERAS pathway. So it was fine. Teamwork makes success. We were, as in the Swiss boat Alinghi last year in Valencia, looking in the same direction. But as you know, in God we trust, all others must show data. So I will, give you, I will show you some of our results. Before ERAS implementation, we had a compliance of 40%, not so good, and a length of stay of 10 days. Last week, in April 2014, we have a quite good compliance of 75%, and with a reduction of uh, three days of, that, of length of stay. And it is about more than 600 patients, including emergency surgery. Now let's talk about money. We did um, a little study in 2012, which were published in BGS last year, and we were interested not uh, only in the outcome of the patient with the ERAS protocol, but also with the cost of the ERAS protocol. And we, take, we took 50 patients before ERAS implementation and 50 patients after the implementation. The outcome was quite good, a reduction of length of stay, no more but no less complications also. And for the money, even if the implementation of ERAS pathway and the intraoperative cost, especially with the minimal invasive surgery, are higher than in the standard K, we still made an economy of 1,651 euros per patient. So it was good. And what about compliance to the protocol now? So these are the famous 19 items of ERAS in the preoperative, perioperative, and postoperative period. And so we have a, some, a quite good compliance of 75%, but what about the non-compliance item and who were responsible for that? Was it the nurses, the patients himself? or the doctors. So, you know, it's a surgical word. So it's never me, it's you. So ha let's have a look in the mirror, of course. So, so
So we took 76 patients last year in the ERAS protocol for colorectal surgery, and we were interested in, in the non-compliant items. And after that, we analyzed who, take, who took the decision to be non-compliant. And after that, we, we tried to analyze if it was medically justified or not. So this is a result of the pre- and perioperative compliance. It's quite good, except for four items, the sedative premedication, the epidural catheter, the, uh, the prophylaxy of postoperative nausea and vomiting, and the drains. And who were guilty? The anesthetist, of course, because he decided to give or not sedative premedication, put or not an epidural catheter, probably forget to give prophylaxy of PONF, and the surgeon, of course, he's responsible for the drains. So, surgeon, 22%, anesthetist, 61%. And for the postoperative period, it's a little bit more patchy, and you see that the compliance is not so good as in the prayer or perioperative period. So, who is guilty? Surgeon, who decide the IV fluids on the wards, who decide not to pull out the, the Foley catheter at day one. And the patient is sometimes also guilty because he doesn't like the energetic supplements on the zero and D1. And the nurse who decide not to mobilize the patient at, at day zero. But I have to admit that when the patients arrive on the ward at seven or eight o'clock in the evening, it's quite difficult for a nurse to mobilize him about two hours in, in the evening, especially with reduction of the staff of the nurses at that time. So, surgeon 21%, nurse 13%, patient 24%, and the anesthetist 19%. So, who is the winner now? Nurse, of course, are in the third position. They are doing quite well with uh, new protocols and guidelines. Patient is in, is in the second position, and the winner is, of course, the doctors. But was it really medically justified or not? In general, yes. We don't put any more any catheter, epidural catheter for laparoscopic surgery, and the patients are uh, operating in a, in a minimal invasive surgery manner, so it was justified. The drain for the surgeon also. And in the postoperative compliance, it was also justified, except probably for some epidural catheter that the anesthetist decided to, le to leave or to put out before. So, in general, 78% of the non compliant items were medically justified. So, what does it mean? It means that compliance of the protocol is the in institution. But with the protocol, it's the individual, and the individual is the patient, the nurses, or the doctors. And is that new? No, it's not new. Uh, this is a, um, an article published in JAMA in 1999 about why don't physicians follow clinical practice guidelines. And there is a lot of reason to not follow the guidelines. There is problem of knowledge, lack of familiarity, lack of awareness of the guidelines, a problem of attitude, I will not, uh, it will not work, or I, will, I can't do it, or lack of motivation, like inertia, like uh, habit, routines, dogma, and problem of behavior with external barriers like uh, um, patient factors, patient preference, with guidelines factors. Sometimes the guidelines is just in contradiction with the clinical condition and at the least environmental factors, lack of time, lack, lack, lack of resources, lack of organization, lack of reimbursement of the guidelines. And of course, you will always have some person who are not agree with specific guidelines and who are not agree with guidelines in general. And as Debbie told us before, we have to put them away. So, Prospective online audits helps to disperse misperceptions, to measure what we are doing, and this is very important, to readapt protocols if it is needed, to make some research, and to fight old and new dogma. So I 
I come back on my first slides. The ERAS Essentials, a dedicated team, yes. Elaborating ERAS protocol, do well, be compliant to the protocol, and an audit research will help you to be compliant, to measure your success with the ERAS pathway, and to change or to readapt the protocols if needed. Thank you for your attention.